Welcome to episode number five of One Bill's Light, the Grand Prix of One Bill's Live, where we bring you fresh content, the numbers game, and our best interview of the week. Time to roll out. Tasker, touchdown, Buffalo. And it's Steve Tasker who has been all over the field. Kind of unique. He was kind of a dual role player for you. Steve. A balloon. Steve. A blimp. We're not even in the stratosphere of normalcy. Chris Brown along with Steve Tasker here on One Bill's Light, the appetizer-sized version of One Bill's Live. This week we've got former San Francisco 49ers DB and three-time Pro Bowler and Super Bowl 29 champion Eric Davis, who is also a current analyst of the Niners on the Believe Podcast Network. But before we get with Eric about the Bills-Niners matchup, we're going to jump right into the numbers game as we test Steve's figure figuring. So, Steve, we've talked a lot about how the scoring has been up league-wide all season long. Right. First of all, what do you believe are the biggest reasons why scoring in the league is at an all-time high this season? No preseason, and surprisingly, um, I think – Teams, quarterback play has been the one reason. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's young quarterbacks. Usually the young quarterbacks in the league don't light it up the way Joe Burrow did when he was still healthy and playing. Right. And Justin Herbert did when he was still healthy and playing. You've still got Kyler Murray, who's still young in his career. Josh Allen has taken a huge step forward. You can go down the list. There are a lot of quarterbacks that are playing extremely well. Ben Roethlisberger's back in the saddle. You've still got Phillip Rivers throwing downstairs. Tom Brady down in Indianapolis. Tom Brady in Tampa Bay. Drew Brees. I mean, you've got a, a league that more so – then maybe at any point has got quarterbacks who have got some a pedigree plus the young guys who are really playing well. That to me is it. I think it's a little bit of the quarterback play plus I think it has been the no preseason. And I think the league has told the, the officials – Unless it's egregious, keep the flag in your pocket. And that that always plays into the, yeah, the hands I, of the offense. I think the lack of holding calls has been yeah. gigantic for the offenses. It keeps them on schedule in terms of down and distance. So they're not in first and 20, second and 20, you know, whatever right. it is. It, it, it helps them immeasurably in terms of play calling. And then I think the no preseason hurt defenses more than it hurt offenses. And the whole offseason in general, because when you think about it, we think about Josh and how he went down to South Florida, worked with the entire yeah. offense. You can rep things a lot better with route concepts and, you know, the, the passing game than you can getting 11 defenders on the field and say, hey, let's run this, because you still need 11 other guys coming at you to, to execute a defensive play call. Yeah. I think there, it's easier to replicate offense on air than defense on air in terms right. of reps. And I think because of that, there's no ramp up. You get to the regular season, it's like, okay, play tackle football full speed on defense. It's like, what? What? Right. I, I think there was an adjustment period, and I think defenses have been playing catch-up ever since. And I think you're starting to see, too, a little bit uh, of the evolution of player safety. You got players, and the, the passing rules were the illegal contact, holding te teams are using the picks and the rubs underneath defenseless receivers uh, you've got offensive schemes around the league now that are very flexible and you've got enough quarterbacks that are playing them and, and getting out of bad plays uh it's much more prevalent now in, in this day and age you got quarterbacks who can run and you're talking about maybe one or two uh, like a 12 play drive you're talking about one or two plays yeah. that a quarterback runs for three yards gets the first down where in years past because of the physical price they would pay or because they just weren't it wasn't part of the game or wasn't in their skill set, a lot of quarterbacks didn't do it. And, you, and those two plays on a 12-play drive, or if it's even one, it's a third down that they yeah, convert. They that seem they small, but it's a conversion, it's a and conversion. the drive continues. All of that stuff adds on to this uh, to this success that they're having. More teams going for it on fourth down this year, too. That's right. That's right. And so, the, bill, the Bills are 100% on fourth down yeah, conversion. I think so. they've only done it a handful of times. Uh, but four, I think. They're yeah. four for four. But they're, they haven't missed yet. More scoring obviously means more players are finding their way to the end zone for every single team in the league. In fact, through Week 12, 362 different players have combined to score 1,001 touchdowns this season. It's the highest number of different players and the most touchdowns scored through the first 12 weeks of a season in NFL history. So... Uh, most players to score touchdowns through Week 12 in NFL history. It's 362 right now for this season. That eclipses the highest previous year, which was 2013, 359, 2012, 2015, also on the list. But, Steve, do you know how many different Bills players 
have scored touchdowns right. for the team this season because it's, it is already a team record after right. 12 it's weeks. Been, it's been a couple weeks, but I read an article. They started out like a house on fire. They had a bunch of different guys catching right. them. And I think the number then was 11. So if they got the record, I'm going to think it's 12. I'm going to say tw- I would say 12 because I'd read this a couple of weeks ago and I can't yeah. remember exactly what it was. So I'm 12 is my number. You are very that. close. The answer is 13. Thir- Thir- man, they different are quick g- on the buzzer. 13 doing? people have 13 different, different guys Bills this year? have scored touchdowns. Wow. Okay. In uh, I mean, think about it. 13 different players in 11 games. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, now the the Bills' top four leaders in touchdowns scored. I'm going to give you them: Josh Allen with seven. Gabriel Davis with four, Diggs and Zach Moss also with four each. Steve, can you name the nine other Bills players who have at least one touchdown this season? And I'm going to give you a hint. There are no defensive or special teams touchdowns scored right. yet this season. So all this right. is all offensive. All right, here we go. I, I think I can I'm gonna do check it. them off as I you get. I think I can do it. So you got to go with the eligible receivers. That means it's got to be Beasley. Yes. Um, Isaiah McKenzie? Yes. Had that rushing touchdown. Right. Okay. And then you've got, uh, here's the thing, Lee Smith. Yes. Tyler. Oh, he Tyler gets the Lee Smith. I didn't think you were going to get Lee Smith. Lee Smith, Tyler Croft, correct, and correct. Dawson Knox. That's five I got? Dawson Knox just last week. Yeah. First touchdown that of the season. That was the record getter, right? Had to be. What's And how? that's five I got? So you've got five already. So, yes. All right. Four, four to more. go. Gilliam. Reggie Gilliam, ooh, good one, down in Miami. One catch, one touchdown. That Singletary? Singletary, yes. So that's seven, I got two more. You got two left. Okay, you Hold can on. do this. I can get it. Uh, There's an obvious one you haven't mentioned. Yet. Andre Roberts, did you get one? Not he Andre didn't Roberts, one. no. Okay, that's my first miss. Um, T.J. Yeldon did not score a touch. Did he? He did. Did he? Okay. I'll give it to you because you give said his me. name. All right. Then <laughs> last one. Them. I got last this one. This is the easy one. You're going to kick yourself if you don't get this. All right. Come on. You got eight out of nine. Come on. Sweep it, man. Let me go through. All right. Beasley. Oh, John Brown. John Brown. I mean, I Very good, it. Steve. Yeah, John Brown. You got all nine. Nicely done. Right. Um, so the Bills are also averaging, Steve, the third most total yards per game. In franchise history, if they can maintain their current average of 372 and a half yards per game, it will be the second highest total yards per game total in franchise history for a season. So first, Steve, do you think they can maintain that level of production here down the stretch with five games to play? Five tough games to the Steelers, Niners, Dolphins, Patriots. 372.5. I mean, Broncos. Yeah. I'm going to say I'm going to say no. You're going to say no. I'm okay. going to say no. Why do you think that? You just because think the defenses the Steelers, are going to – Because of the Steelers' defense, because of the Niners' defense, even though it's yeah. their man, they got Robert Salah, who's really doing one of their top defense. Denver, they're going to run it up, I think. Uh, I think the Patriots, they always – you know, they it's hold, always a yeah, middle keep, school. It's always like game. 17 to 24-point game in there someplace, somewhere where these two teams. And then Dolphins, I think we own the Dolphins, but that's only two of those five games, even if we – and ring it up against the Dolphins and the Broncos. Those other might three not games be enough to maintain enough. the average. Yeah, so. and, and you got to worry a little bit about a wacky weather game. I mean, you're going up to Denver. Right. You don't know what you're going to get the up altitude. there. And then you've got you know the two games. You got New England. Miami. You don't know gonna what you're going to get good. up there. Miami you don't will know be good. This game against San Francisco, they'll be okay. And then it's Monday night here against Pittsburgh. In the yeah yeah. I, you don't know what you're going to get. And that I don't could think compromise. Gonna, I don't things. think they can do it. I think the, the weather conditions and the quality of the teams they have to finish with. All right. So next question in the numbers game here, Steve. Can you name the years of the top three Bills seasons in total yards per game? The top three seasons that are on the list right. right now. Give me the years if you can. Ninety-one Bills. That is number one. Correct. Three hundred ninety point eight yards per game. So good job there. 92 Bills? No. Not the 92 Bills. 88 Bills. Bills. Not the 88 Bills. 90. Not 90. I was shocked when I saw this list. I really was. I will tell you, there are no more of your teams really? on this list. All right, so it's got to be the 65, 65 Bills. Not the 65 Bills. 64 Bills. Bills. Yes, 64 Bills. Uh, 371.9 yards per game. In 19, that's the third highest. So you're, you're missing the number two 
yards per game record holders for the Bills Gotta in a single 80, season. 82, 80, 80, 82 Bills? Not the 82 uh, Bills. Not the 80 Bills. What was that year they had? Oh, that's got to be more recent. What am I talking about? Got to be like one of those. Got to be 2012 or something like that, right? Not 2012. Am I in the right decade? You are not. <laughs> the 04, 03, somebody? 04, no, 04. it is not. I'll give you another hint. It is not this century. And oh, 98. So, or 99. It's those guys. It's not the play. 99 build. No. Rob and Doug. No, and they, see, that 99 team, they had the number one defense in football that year. And they were winning games like 13 10, yeah. 17 16. You know, they, they weren't blowing right. people out of the water. Let's. Uh... So I will give you a decade, okay? It's the 70s. Really? Yeah. So. Oh, 73 with juice. Not 73. 72. Not 74. <laughs> it's got to be right in there, right? It's right in there, yeah. 71. Nope. That was the one in 75. It is 75. Really? 1975. Okay. Right. And that was the year that Juice, I wanted, that was his last big season. I want to say he ran, he had like 1,800 something yards right. in total scrimmage yards or something. He was real close again. Uh, carried the team, but that team largely underachieved. I mean, they averaged 390.5 yards per game, and they were a running offense. I mean, think about that. Wow. 390 yards a game. And, and they had a great offensive line then. They went 8-6 and six and missed the playoffs that year. 8-6. and six. You forget. That is unbelievable. 14, you think about those 14-game seasons. 390 yards a game as a running football team, though, Steve. That's, That's an cool. enormous number in 1975. Enormous. Yeah. I mean, you think about where this league has gone. They're That's, still number two on the Bills list. That's uh, They're better than any of those other 90s years besides think, 91. What were they doing? They couldn't play action or anything? You know, like, you know what I mean? Get the ball down the field? I don't know. Wow. Because Ferguson's only a third-year quarterback that year. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's so, the, so here's the encouraging thing. The Bills have reached the championship game or the Super Bowl in two of those three seasons when they averaged 370 total yards per game or more. And right now... Only the 1991 Bills averaged more yards per game than this current Bills team uh, in franchise history. So how encouraged are you knowing the production level and the history of teams with comparable production level? Are you like, does it encourage you about where this team could go this year? Uh, no, because it's a different league. It's not you can't really take history out of it. You know, you got to take history out of it. I right. guess is what I'm saying, because. You know, the, the atmosphere of the league, like we said, they're scoring more touchdowns than anybody any other era. It's not just the Bills. It's kind of the atmosphere of the league. Yeah. So while, yeah, no question, the Bills are playing well even in this environment, but I don't think it stands apart like it would if had they done it in, you know, in yeah. an earlier decade. I get what you're saying. I mean, we were just talking about that earlier. I mean, I'm, I'm talking See, about the, the 75, 75 Bills team. 75 Bills team, that stands out. I mean, that is. That stands out. This is just. You know, this is right in the mix with every with everybody else in the league. Right That's kind of that seventy five team's kind of a picture of how tough the AFC was back then with the Raiders and the Steelers and Dolphins. Yeah, even were the Oilers good back then? I'm trying to remember. Yes. I think they Love were a decent blue. team. They were seventy uh, five. Yeah, they yeah. were they were taking the Earl Steelers. Was, they were taking the Steelers. Yes, they were taking the Steelers to the limit. So right AFC during the mid seventies, tough man. I mean, that was a productive Bills team and eight and six. Yeah, that was. Whew, yeah, that was tough. All right, that's uh, it for the numbers game portion of our program. Time now for our conversation with former 49ers defensive back Eric Davis, who talks about the job Kyle Shanahan and his staff have done amidst the slew of injuries that they've had in San Francisco, the impact of the move to Arizona for the better part of the next three weeks on the players, and how he expects the Niners to defend Josh Allen. Former NFL corner who played for 13 seasons. His career lasted as long as this guy to my left. Two Pro Bowls, three-time All-Pro, and one Super Bowl 39 with the 49ers. It is Eric Davis joining us on the line right now to talk Bills Niners for Monday Night Football. Mr. Davis, how are you, sir? I'm well, holding on for an old man. Oh, you, you know, Meg's still under me all those years having to chase Steve around. I didn't tear up my hamstrings too much, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm still here. Yeah, you, yeah, you caught me enough times that and that I remember it. So, yeah. How, uh, how is how is it? I know you're you're on a Facetime with us. You're outdoors. What is it? What's the environment like out there? Um, 
You know, yeah, we hear you, all we hear is that that everything's shut down for the 49ers. What's it like for everybody else? Um, well, you you know, it's, I'm I'm actually in LA, and everything's been shut down. We've never really come out of it since since um, things really went down. We never really got back to full speed, so we're going backwards. And they're talking about possibly shutting everything down here in, in Los Angeles and Los Angeles County uh, completely. So. Uh, you know, you know, you never got back into restaurants. There were things that were slowly opening, you know, curbside. People could go out and eat outside. They, they transferred all the parking lots into um, restaurants and, and into dining. But uh, all of that is starting to disappear. As far as the, you know, it, the players and speed, I think you can talk to Zach Toll, everyone. As far from a player standpoint, uh, you just kind of just go with the flow. It, it, you, you're accustomed to that bunker mentality, I think. Um, and, you know, you just have to deal, you know, injuries are always a part of it. COVID is just another one of those things. The only, the only caveat is all the risks that you take as a player, all the concerns that you have, you take those on personally. This is something that you can take home to your family. Um, and they didn't sign up for, for football injury. They didn't find, sign up for the risk, so you don't want that. But beyond that, um, and, and I know that's a big hill, that's a big hurdle, uh, for, for the players, I don't think it's as big a deal as everyone's making it out to be. What about having to uproot your entire daily football operation, though, for the next three weeks and move it to Arizona? Is that a different animal? Um, yes and no. Again, once you get in, I mean, I'm a player. Uh, I don't have to worry. That's the great thing about being a player. I don't have to worry about all the what if. I don't have to get paralyzed by the what if. You put me you put me in the room, you say be at the meeting at this time. Watch film at this time. You're gonna have time on the practice field at this time. Walk through the certain time, practice a certain time, treatments a certain time for your any any type of injury you have to deal with. I'm just gonna stick to the routine. Whether I'm doing that in Santa Clara, whether I'm doing that in Arizona, it doesn't really matter. If I'm on the road for a road game, we always left on Fridays and and if you have to spend time around uh, another facility, you just do it. And, and actually, when I played for the 49ers, there were times during the playoffs where we would actually leave uh, because it would be in the middle of rainy season. So to get in quality work, they would actually, Eddie DeBartolo would actually put us up over in Arizona and we would practice in Arizona hmm. because it was dry. So right. um, I, I don't, outside of not having your family, the rest of it is just what ball players do. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's also something the 49ers have had to do even when they were in Santa Clara. They're setting a team record. They got 74 players have been on their team on the field for a game this year. Give us an idea what that atmosphere must be like. Uh, well, you never know who's playing. It's, it's yeah. very difficult. <laughs> uh, part of the reason I, I think the coaching staff is doing a great job this year. There has been a lot put on these guys um, because of the injuries. There have been a lot of people having to figure out uh, who's going to play. I mean, Cal Shanahan has had weeks where he has literally gone into uh, the, the work week and a couple of days before the game, you lose, you know, both starting wide receivers, a running back, a tackle. Um, you can't game plan around that when you have less than 24 hours to bring up guys from the practice squad and get them ready. It's going to limit what you have on that call sheet. They've been finding ways to still be competitive. There are very few times you would look at this squad, even with the rash of injuries that they have, where you would look at them and say they weren't competitive. Um, and this is not the 49ers team. I, I, that's one thing I feel good about because, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the better teams in the league this year is the 49ers IR. <laughs> and right. So they're not rebuilding. They just have to get healthy. And they may actually even end up better off next year uh, because the scheduling and, and you know, their win-loss record may put them in a position uh, because of these injuries to draft some really good players moving forward to add to what's already in the cover. So, um, you know, it's been tough knowing who's going to play, when they're going to play, and there are certain elements that you have to have to be successful within this defense and offense for the 49ers. And they just don't have their front line guys. So uh, I'm not mad about what's going on. I'm, I'm not looking at this as a championship team. I'm not upset if they don't make the playoffs because I know the reason why they're there. Talking to Eric Davis from uh, the Believe in 49ers podcast, former uh, DB for the Niners as well. And 
Eric, I know that uh, you mentioned a lot of the front line players are down, but the defense is still playing pretty lights out yeah. football. And last week's, you know, game probably is the most recent example of that with the win that they uh, helped stage over the Rams. All that being said, I, you might find this hard to believe because you watch this team all the time, but I still don't think Fred Warner gets the respect league-wide or on a national scale that he probably deserves. How much has he been a linchpin for an injury-riddled defense this season? Did we lose him? Did he freeze? Oh, he oh, froze. Him. And I lo- oh, there, there you go. Oh, you're back. I lost. Okay. Here I am. I lost you there for a second. Did you get my full question about Fred Warner? How much of a linchpin has he been I- for this defense? Um, well, Fred is, he's, he's that dude. He, he really is. He's, he's a standard, standard bearer. Um, one of the great things that happened to him, and it happens for all young players when you have, a, you know, a veteran guy that can come in and, and sort of teach you certain things to, to show you the ropes, to, to teach you what it's like to be a pro. That's one of the most important things. And that was part of the great things that I was on. And I'm sure Steve would say the same thing. Um, one of the elements that you have to have to have a good organization is to have guys that um, veterans that aren't afraid to teach the next guy how to take their job. And Fred has, has always been a sponge. And the old, any old head guys that have told him anything, he has taken it, taken it in and incorporated it into his game. Um, and the thing about it is that he is just so incredibly gifted. Uh, that he is capable of just making great plays. And I get asked all the time, what do you expect from Fred? And I just, and I always say, I just expect him to play like Fred. And, and a, a comment I make all the time is that he hunts wisely. And, he, and I mean, he's out there. He knows how to look at the information in front of him and discern what needs to be done. He, he takes the right angle. He makes the right play. He puts himself into position to come up with something big in a timely manner. And um, it's just been huge uh, having him out there with all, especially with all the injuries that you have. I mean, you lose your front line guy in the secondary in Sherm. You lose your front guy, front line guys up front in um, uh, Nick Bosa. D4, you lose that pass rush. So that middle guy, um, he's been able able to be, you know, a stabilizing force for them. And um, I think I heard how you how you started the league. We're sleeping on him. I think those days are over. <laughs> if everyone sees that Fred's a pro bowler, he's an all pro. Yeah. I don't think he has to worry about that anymore. Yeah, and one of the other guys that you know that is a kind of standard bearer, or at least the face of the franchise, was Jimmy Garoppolo, and he's not there. And Nick Mullins taking over for him. Uh, there's a. I could go down the list, but I want to start, just may as well start with the quarterback since it's a, a position everybody knows. Is yeah. yeah how is the franchise, what's the opinion of the franchise about Jimmy Garoppolo going forward? I mean, it's amazing to me that, you know, he got him to the Super Bowl, and then all of a sudden he plays against a team that's really good, and everybody, you know, outside of the organization thinks he stinks all of a sudden. Uh, what's the franchise think about him, and, and is he in their plans, and what are their plans for him going forward? Um, well, the plans, uh, that's always a tricky one because of the way they put together his contract. I mean, they can they can walk away from Jimmy. I think it's an excellent job of the way they did it because they can walk away from Jimmy, no harm, no foul. They won't, you know, no dead money. Um, you know, it, it won't cost them any. They don't have to worry about draft picks or anything. If they, if they decide to move on, they can. So from that aspect, what um, – uh, what John Lynch did, I, I, I always said he GM'd his tail off putting that deal together. Now, as far as Jimmy goes, yeah, a lot of people can say Jimmy can't. He or he doesn't have the strong arm. He can't handle pressure in the pocket. He can't do these things. Jimmy wins. And um, Kyle Shanahan has this moniker of being, you know, the next and this genius uh, play caller. Uh, but without Jimmy under center, He's lost a lot of football games here for the 49ers. He has a losing record now. Uh, with Jimmy under center, they win. So the organization understands the importance of him being here. Uh, you get, you hear all of this talk about anyone can do it, and it's a systems guy. Well, he hasn't found another guy that can do it here. And Jimmy is by far the best quarterback on the 49ers team. Now, whether or not they're going to um, move on from him, I think just like at every position, that has a lot to do with who's going to be on the market. Right. Uh, you, you know, if you have an Aaron Rodgers on the market, I think you have to consider that. 
a Matt Ryan, even a Dak, Dak, Prask, Dak, um, Dak Prescott. There are things that you have to consider if these guys are there. But bottom line, Jimmy wins. He's taking them to a Super Bowl. I think they'd have a better record right now if he was under center because history says while he's there, they win football games. Talking to Eric Davis, and, uh, you know, the next thing I wanted to bounce off you, you know, Mullins is in the lineup. Kittle is not going to be back anytime in the immediate future. I know they got Debo back, but it seems as though most teams are saying, all right, well, let's just stack the box against this Shanahan design run game and force Mullins to beat us with his arm. Uh, how has that gone for the most part, that kind of approach <laughs> defensively against this Niners team? Uh, it makes it very difficult to call a game if you're Kyle Shanahan uh, because you just touched on it. Uh, I said on my podcast that it would have been impossible. Uh, it, it's impossible for Nick Mullins to have a good day for any of the secondaries that I played in uh, because I've seen enough of them. And I, I know the guys that I play with. And we would have realized Nick Mullins, they, they play the game within an 18-yard box. It's an 18-yard bubble. Um, and, and I'm not worried about you throwing beyond that 18 yard bubble because your arm is not strong enough. This is not this is not a, a Patrick Mahomes arm where I have to worry about chasing down a ball 70 yards in the air. You can't throw it that far. So you can't throw it over my head um, far enough for me to not be able to catch up to it. So everyone's playing everything downhill. So without the speed, uh, Raheem Mostert coming back changes things dramatically because he puts so much pressure and the way he's stressed, uh, way, the way he can press and stress the edge of a defense, that you have to move immediately at, when you're a secondary level defender or, or, or you know, a linebacker. You have to be able to move quickly to get in position to tackle him, which leaves the misdirection and the, and the openings for Nick Mullins to make plays. So him coming back should help. Debo coming back again with the with the uh you know the jet sweep runs and those type things the hands off that'll help nick mullins create some space with the mis misdirection but it's going to be difficult because you just touched on it we all know it we all see it he doesn't have the arm that's going to push the ball down the field um everyone keeps saying kyle you know why don't you call those plays it makes no sense to call them because you don't have the quarterback that can throw them uh so it's going to continue to be difficult but you we talked about this defense being able to play at a high level and keep games close. That's that's the way they're going to play it now. They're going to not try to have a quarterback win the game. They're going to try to let the defense do some things and keep them in it and try to win them close. And you, you bring up a good question about Kyle Shanahan, which plays he calls from outside and over back here in the East Coast time zone. Uh, there's a lot of respect flying around for Kyle Shanahan and what he's done for that organization. You've watched him; he's gotten them to the Super Bowl, back to the Super Bowl, uh, where they were so uh, that they were so familiar with back in the 1980s. Uh, what is your like when you're describing Kyle Shanahan as a guy who pays a lot of attention to the San Francisco 49ers, and you were there before he got there, and you've watched his entire career there? What strikes you about why he is such? an effective head coach. Obviously, he's a play caller, but there's got to be – there's way more to it than that. Uh, you know what? I think he's a pro. He, he, he's a pro, and, and by that, I mean he knows what he's doing. He knows how to explain it. Um, he has a system. There are a lot of different systems that can win, uh, but, it's, but it's difficult to if guys don't believe in the system. And he is – he is such a professional and understands how to communicate and get the information across to the guys in an effective manner that they that it's believable. That's the number one thing. He's straight with the guys. Um, he lets them know what he expects from them. Um, he he doesn't deviate from that. Uh, there's a certain standard that he holds to himself to. He holds the and all of the players to his coaching staff to as well. And I think that's a very important part of it. Another thing that he does that I have been very impressed with, um, and I've seen it happen this season, he'll take the hit for his players. There, there, there are time, he understands the importance of certain players on the team, what they're, the juice that they have with the rest of the guys. And there are some guys that you just can't undress. There are certain players, the, the guys in the locker room know when, when one of the leaders have screwed up. But, but it's something about a head coach or coordinator, play caller, not undressing these guys in front of the press. And he's been able to do that um, and take the hits, I think, when, when necessary. 
uh, to keep guys from having to be thrown under the bus. And that carries weight. I think that carries a lot of weight in the locker room. And I think moving forward, you're going to see a lot more belief in the system uh, to where when these guys talk, you don't have to say a whole lot. That's how it was with Bill Walsh. That's how it was with George Seifert. It got to a point where you knew what they what they had you doing would work, and you start to listen to any critiques that they have in a different manner. And I think that's what it is. He, and that's why I, I, I started it off by saying he's just a pro. And when you're dealing with other professionals, you need they need to know that, hey, he can make me better. I, my, I can get better at my craft if I listen to this guy and what he's saying and what his coaching staff is saying, and they believe it. Last one I've got for you, Eric, uh, concerns the other matchup coaching-wise, and that's between Bill's OC, Brian Dable, and the D.C. out there, Robert Saleh. So, you know, you look at the job that the Niners' D.C. has done this year, it might be his best year yet. I mean, keeping that a top-10 unit with all the injuries they've sustained – I mean, he's probably on a rocket ship to a head coaching job, but a lot of people are starting to mention Dable's name in head coaching candidacy circles as well. Um, is there anything that intrigues you about the matching of wits there for this game on Monday night? Uh, well, yeah, I want to see um, you know kryptonite uh, to the 49ers defense um, has been, even before the injury, a running quarterback. Uh, you When you have a mobile quarterback, and, and, and I – now I say that, but – I, I spend all sorts of time constantly telling people a running quarterback is kryptonite to every defense because it's rare that you're going to design defenses to account for a quarterback. But you've got a big athletic guy under center up there, as you guys all know about him. By the way, I like him a lot. I, I've always liked him, um, and I've, I'm a big fan of where he can possibly turn into um, and, and Allen. I, I really do like it. So, it's going to be intriguing to see what he does this week. You know, they have, you know, you look at this division with Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson that they, he's had to battle with, you know, Sala uh, is as, as a D, as, as the DC, he understands uh, the, the stress and the pressure that, that, that a mobile quarterback can put on it. But you also have to um, deal with that strong arm that he has. So um, the chess match is going to be how much I, I would like to see, how much he's going to commit to not allowing Josh Allen to be um, the guy outside of the pocket. What is he going to try and do? Um, and I, and I, I would imagine he has to have something knowing that you down the road that you have to deal with Kyler Murray and Russell Wilson again. You have to already be implementing that in. But so that's 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 really what I'm looking at. How, you know, how are you going to contain him? and not let him get outside of the tackle box and make plays against you. All right. Eric, thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. No problem. Glad to join you guys. Yeah, good to see you. We'll we'll catch up with you down the line here. That's uh, Eric Davis, former NFL cornerback for the Niners, 13 years in the league and three-time Pro Bowler, and he's the host of the Believe in 49ers podcast. All right. Always good when you can get a solid breakdown of the upcoming game. Our thanks to Eric Davis for that. Steve, we're going to do a little in-season assessment and ask the question, should we be concerned? We talk all the time about all the scar tissue that Bills fans have built up over the last 20 years. So I'm going to present some trends connected to the Bills, and then I'm going to ask you the question, should we be concerned? Okay, so here's the first one. Starting quarterbacks age 26 or younger are 1-4 and four against the 49ers this season. Starters age 27 and older are 5-1. and one. It's a crazy stat. It's right. probably an anomaly you know, when you think about it or break it down. But Josh Allen, as we know, is only 24 years old. So applying this statistic to Monday night's game between the Bills and Niners, should we be concerned? All right, let me just do this then. Here's why. Here's how you do these answers. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> you go back and you look at who the San Francisco 49ers had to play and look at their quarterbacks that way. Those young quarterbacks they played against were uh, Kyler Murray lost Mm -hmm. to the Niners. Sam Darnold, uh, Kyler Murray, no, no, Kyler Murray won. Kyler Murray beat him. So he's the one. He's the one. Sam Darnold lost. Uh, Daniel Jones lost. So they beat Russell Wilson. He's tw- he's over twenty seven. No, they 30. got beat by Russell Wilson. Yeah, they so, got beat by by. Uh, so you basically Aaron Don- have Aaron Aaron Rodgers, and they got beat by Drew Brees. Yeah. So the AFC least and the NFC least 
were some right. of the losers. So no, I'm not concerned. Not concerned at I'm all. Not concerned. Okay, at all. fair they, enough. They got uh, they beat the Rams. I'm not terribly concerned either, Twice. but I think it's more due to the fact that they're going to be going against a backup quarterback. No George Kittle. <laughs> That's what makes me feel better about this game more than anything well, else. Meet Joe, uh, Tommy Bosa. Is that or Nick Tom? Bosa? Nick Bosa. Nick Bosa. The Bosa brother, he's not there. Yeah, um, or Solomon Thomas. Solomon Thomas is not or there. Or D. Ford, the other D pass Ford. rusher. I mean, they I got mean, some guys. Yeah, but yeah, none of them is, are playing, thankfully. Yeah. So none of those guys are in. So I, I do not put any credence on that stat between young quarterbacks, old quarterbacks. It's interesting, but the old quarterbacks are Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees. Yeah, you know? it's a, it's a and, group of dudes. And – yeah, it's so, a group of dudes, and, they, and Carson Wentz, who you know put it together for that one game. Yeah. So. All right. Question number two, the, and I'm going to flip it around to defense. The Bills have allowed more passing touchdowns in 11 games this season than they did in all of 2019. Right. We still got five games to play, so 16 passing touchdowns allowed this year, 15 all of last year. Applying this statistic to Buffalo's playoff hopes, should we be concerned, especially knowing how many? Footballs are flying around these days. I'm going to say only slightly. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, only slightly, you know, right? The whole league is doing this. But I think the Bills, here's what I see. The Bills defense is getting better now. They're getting better now yeah. as we get They're get, trending up. They're trending up. And they're playing their quarterbacks that they're playing in the near future uh, while they are, you know, it's going to be a tough road to hoe. I mean, you know, you got to know they're playing the kid out, you know, Drew Locke. Well, you got Roethlisberger coming up. Right. You know, Roethlisberger. And, but Tua, I, I'm sorry. Tua doesn't scare me yet. No, no. Not yet. Cam Newton scares me. And, and, uh, uh, Roth, Ben Roethlisberger scares yeah. me. But this, the guy, Mullen, no. Drew Locke, What no, about when you so get to the playoffs, Tuna, no. though? When you get to the playoffs, it's, it's a different situation. You t- let's think AFC here and the teams that are probably going to be there. You're talking Tannehill, Roethlisberger, Mahomes. I mean, you got a group of dudes that you're going to have to go up against. Um, possibly yeah. Lamar Jackson. Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers. I mean, these are the cast of characters you're going to be dealing with. So does that concern you? Should we be concerned? I'm, I'm, I'm going to say maybe. Because I'm going to say maybe. I'm, maybe. I'm going to, I'm going to, well, you said maybe, too, pretty much. I said not so much. Yeah, well, that's kind of a maybe. But I, th- I, think, it's, I think maybe also. But I, I believe that the Bills' defense is trending up, and proof of that is a better pass rush and 10, intercept, 10 takeaways in their last five games. To me, while they, may be able, while they may be giving up points, they're also giving extra possessions to their offense, and so that encourages me to say, well, even if they're giving up a little bit more on the back end in terms of scoring, if they're going to keep giving their offense more possessions, I'm not as concerned as right. maybe I would be this time last year if this was something that was happening because they could not score with any kind right. of consistent proficiency. Yeah. All right. Now, you're going to get some good quarterbacks in the, in the playoffs. Yes. So, and playoffs are always a concern because the other team is there and they're playing well. So, yeah. yes, you, you should be concerned in every respect when you get into the playoffs because you're, you're going to play against a really good football team. All right, finally, the Bills have allowed both 20 points or more and 400 yards or more in five games this season, which is more than the last two seasons combined, Steve. Previously, right. just two such games since 2018. Again, with the playoffs in mind, should we be concerned? Yeah, I mean, with the playoffs in mind, you, I think, yeah, you're going to run into some teams that can really go. Last year, you, you got into a, a game with Deshaun Watson, and you take them toe-to-toe, and it ends up they put together a drive in overtime to beat you uh, with, a, and they, you know, with two free rushers onto the quarterback, miss a sack, he shakes it off and wins the game. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, the playoffs, there is no – easy road in the playoffs you can say what you want you can say matchups yeah okay they're easy but it's only easy after the fact when you're going into that game you know you're going to get a team uh, that's going to be playing well I you are always concerned with the playoffs no matter what the statistics say or all that so I'm going to say yes you should be concerned it's a defense that is not the same top three defense it was a year ago it's a different style of defense a different type of defense a different a defense with different strengths uh, so, yeah, you don't know how it's going to look when yeah. you match up. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a flipped team this year. It's not a defense that is consistently going to hold you in games. 
it's an offense that can keep pace in games. That's how this 2020 right. Bills team is different from the 2019 Bills team. So while I might be concerned about the defense holding teams down in the playoffs, uh, I'm confident that the Bills offense will be able to keep pace with whoever they are playing in any given week. And the defense, if they can be what they believe their identity is, taking the ball away and giving more opportunities to the offense, I think they could overcome that. All right, that's all the time we have for this edition of One Bills Light. Our thanks to Eric Davis. And we remind you, you can listen to our One Bills live shows Monday to Friday on all your pop popular podcast platforms. Easy for me to say. But when you don't have time for two hours plus of One Bills Live, you can always join us here for 30 to 40 minutes on One Bills Light. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. We'll catch up with you next week.